we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Happy Tuesday. Welcome to another hour of good nature. Um, been playing around with the lighting out here. Uh, it's going to be too annoying. But if I put it over here, well, that's not too bad. Last time, you know, it gave me that weird ghostly glow. But maybe uh, as it gets darker, we'll be able to um, just kind of uh, enjoy some some smooth, soft lighting for this awesome Tuesday night. I don't know if you've been out, but my goodness, it is a perfect temperature. There's no breeze. Uh, well, maybe a little breeze. There's no strong wind. Um, bugs are minimal right now, although, boy, I wish I could show you. Yeah, you probably don't want to see it. Something nailed me on the neck. I don't know if it was today. I was out at Hickory Knolls today. Uh, we do have a, a few little uh, biting flies in this area, but I've got several welts on my neck. Um, I think there's stuff flying around now. Maybe I got it in my own yard. I don't know. But um, if you do go out and you are sensitive to uh, bug bites, you can put a little repellent on. Um, because I tell you, I, you're going to catch me scratching a few times as we uh, go through our time together this evening. Uh, and then I, you know, I was I was pretty much ready to go um, a little early. And, you know, that's always a dangerous thing because that allows uh, my mind to wander, my eyes to uh, notice things. I'm out here in uh, my backyard and um, I've had this butter uh, container out here for, gosh, a long time. It actually, it has sand in it. This dates back to when we uh, used to raise lubber grasshoppers at the nature center. Lubber grasshoppers are large, not native to this area. Uh, grasshoppers that uh, some people uh, like in the Southeast where they are native uh, consider them a pest because they have those chewing mouth parts and they chew on a lot of different types of plants. Well, we used to uh, have dishes of sand for them to uh, oviposit or deposit their eggs in. And I, I can't remember why I brought this out here. Um, there aren't any eggs in it, but um, I'm gonna see if I can hold this to where you can see. Can you see all those little dark doodles? Those are, that's poop. <laughs> Some, somebody's been doodling here in my butter dish and I don't, I don't know who or what. It's, um, I'm gonna guess a bird. Um, but I, I don't really know. I just, I just found it, like I said, a couple of minutes ago, but it's definitely seeds that they've been feeding on uh, something with berries. I'm going to guess, you know, buckthorn berries uh, from the color and the shape of the seeds um, <clears throat> with all of this yard <laughs> to um, find relief. I don't know what and I, I haven't noticed any critters on my deck either. I mean, I've got the bird bath here over my shoulder. Um, and heaven knows that's kind of a bathroom type thing there too. But this, um, I don't know what this is. It's a mystery. If I get an answer, I will let you know. Um, and I'm also tickled tonight to be, it's warm enough out that I don't have to drink a warm beverage. I've got something cold. Um, this is one of my favorite mugs but it's not microwavable so i tend to only drink cold things in it um hello darkness my old friend come to talk with you again and share a beverage with you um so i've got one other uh, show and tell here thing and that's courtesy of laura it's um nicely packaged uh, for freshness <laughs> It's an owl pellet. Um, it's 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 a good size, but it's not a huge size. I'm guessing this might have been uh, from a barred owl. This is about what they cough up. And just as a quick little refresher, you know, owls. Um, this I've always thought this is just absolutely fascinating. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully you'll agree because I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Um, mice are uh, prominent in the diet, rodents, I should say, are prominent in the diet of owls and snakes. Now, snakes, when they swallow a, a rodent whole, they pass um, 
you know, the, the animal passes through the body, the snake's digestive, uh, the acids in its stomach and its digestive tract are able to just take out, extract just about every bit of nutrient from that rodent. The bones, the teeth, the claws all get liquefied. There's just a little bit of hair that passes through and, and you know, comes out the other end. Owls, on the other hand, they eat a rodent. And their system can really only digest the the uh, protein that's in the the muscles of the animal and the meat and then you know some of the organs, but the uh, indigestible parts, the the bones, which we can kind of see here, and the fur, the teeth, the claws, all that stuff. The owl, um, as part of its digestive system, is able to strip that away uh, and form these pellets, which they then pop out uh, every uh, day or so it depends kind of on what they've been eating how how much food they've taken in it's going to determine how much food they have to get out um, uh, how much um, indigestible matter they need to get out so um, Laura I don't know if you're on tonight um, but I I totally forgot where you found this. We do have a, a, a number and a growing number actually of barred owls in this area and they tend to hang out uh, in uh, woods and they, they particularly like woods that are near water. Um, she is logging in right now, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi, Pam. I, I just, I, I had to get the, the link from Jerry because I forgot to sign up. So I just logged in. <laughs> But I'm seeing a familiar, familiar I, I forgot object. to ask you if you were going to be here. I could have just yeah. said to you. But so where um, was this? Where was this owl pellet found? Well, it was in a really weird spot. It was on the Andrini Trail, mm -hmm. um, but it was like not far up the Andrini Trail, but more in the um, in the path by, okay. by with prairie around it. Like okay. there was no tree um, nearby. So I was kind of curious. Well, um, you know, hawks also produce pellets. So really um, a lot of our uh, birds of prey that are swallowing their their food whole um, do have some sort of uh, regurgitant like this. Hawks, owls, um, crows, uh, herons. In fact, even um, gulls, I found some gull, I watched a gull one time produce a pellet and it was just all kinds of fish bones and things like that. Um, usually the hawk pellets are a little bit smaller because they tend to really um, pluck a lot of the non-digestible things away from the prey. And this does have quite a bit of fur in it. So um, I think they, it looks actually like a little tuft of rabbit there. And this, you know what, this isn't a, if I can hold that to where you can see it, that is not a bone. Oh, I wish this focused in tighter. Uh, that's a, that's a toenail. That's a toe with a nail <laughs> right there. Um, so, uh, no, I take that back. I take that back. It's the lower jaw. My goodness, the neighbor's dogs are not happy about something. No, nope. we should do an owl pellet dissection here um, or pellet dissection. So I think that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, that is actually uh, um, uh, some teeth. Uh, so yeah, that is kind of strange. And, and you know, barred owls, I don't think we've ever seen or heard one in the, so what Laura was talking about, the Andrini Trail is part of the Hickory Knolls natural area. And we do see and hear great horned owls there. Um, but barred owls, um, there is there is actually a nest with barred owls in an up off of Dean Street. That would be, um, you know, less than a mile away, about a half a mile away, which would be within their flight range. I don't know, um, but it's a cool find. And yes, it's definitely an owl pellet. It's compact. Um, like the tech guy hates me. Now I've got a piece of owl pellet in my keyboard. Um, <laughs> but it, um, this, the size, uh, so great horn, just for perspective, they're usually at least 
this big it going you know from the space in here the space here um so uh definitely um and a, a pellet i'm gonna go with owl just because hawk tends to be smaller uh and it is full of fur um so yeah maybe uh maybe we'll find some more laura i've been uh between the two of us i think we're going to be on the andrini trail quite a bit with the <laughs> upcoming school programs <laughs> maybe too 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 much time maybe <laughs> <laughs> well hey, cool hey, Pam, do do this is probably a silly question but do turkey vultures just poop everything out or do they have pellets too well, that's a fantastic question, and I, I've i never heard of a turkey vulture. You know, I know, you know what they tend to do, Laura? They tend to open up what they're feeding on and really kind of go for the guts inside. Um, uh, not, not so much. Following the... whole, like, you know, and yeah. they feed on things like um, deer carcasses and raccoons and, you know, things that that um they uh tear into and eat on the inside so i don't know how much indigestible stuff they can gotcha soak. gotcha um okay. i have heard that they can um you know evacuate their system on both ends when they're not happy <laughs> <laughs> oh, Something i guess we should be glad we don't know any more about <laughs> One more question too, Pam, about yeah. about with comparison with that um, owl pellet, a little uh, eastern screech owl. How how big would? Oh, it you know, I have I actually have a whole cup of screech owl pellets, <laughs> um, in my uh, at my desk. They are um, they're like um, you know, maybe um, two two good and plenties put together um <laughs> got, gotcha i, I got the uh, can relate. yes um, i can oh or mike and ike's mike and ike's yes, yes. but yeah they're not real big and so harder they, to find then yeah so they um the reason i have a cup full of them is that before we had hickory knolls and before we had otter cove uh, the screech owls would roost in the rafters of, I can't remember if it was the soccer building or the splash park at the, in the park, you know, where the nature center is now. And one of the parks guys, uh, actually one of the facilities guys had collected those for me. I came in, this was right after I started at the park district. So these are actually, you know, vintage pellets that go back to 2007. It's your welcoming gift. But they, yeah, it was the coolest. <laughs> I still have them in the same little cup that he put Aww. them in. But there's, um, there's a variety of, of things in them. It's not just fur and small bones, but there were insect wings and, you know, insect legs and uh, things like that, that, um, they are more apt to prey on. Uh, now, I, I I should say, um, I was going to save cicadas for next week, and we'll probably do a bigger thing on it next week. Um, I would love to hear from any of you who were here, as in uh, Kane County in 2007, and remember seeing cicadas, because I didn't. Um, but if you were in an area where there were cicadas, uh, and we're talking the periodical cicadas, the 17 year guys, um, owls, hawks, they are not uh, exempt from eating cicadas, even though they're insects, uh, that is an abundance of free protein that's not apt to fight back. So all of those birds, in addition to the, the songbirds uh, that you know, naturally eat insects. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, consumption going on in the areas where there are those cicadas. Um, so yeah, thanks for this, Laura. I'm going to, uh, I don't want to destroy it because it is such a, a perfect uh, little oval, but I did pull that one piece out here and um, I might see if there's anything else obvious there that might tell us what this creature ate. And that might help give us a clue as to what it was. It is cool. Okay. Much appreciated. Sure. <laughs> All right. So um, 
you know, I think that's about it for show and tell. I took so many pictures over these last two weeks, guys. And I do apologize again for last week. Um, I just completely had slipped my mind that I had agreed to talk to a homeowners group over in uh, West Chicago. So um, uh, we've got, yeah, almost three weeks worth of uh, pictures and stories to get to. Uh, this also means there's been just enough time that old Miss Pam is going to have to remember how to do screen share uh, in a smooth and... Uh, all right, let's see. Let's click these two. Um, I've been having trouble with my speakers. I don't really have anything that's um move this. There we go. Uh, I don't know if we have anything that's got any crucial sound to it. Uh, and I will also say that um, let's get rid of that window. I did not uh, put these ah, in any sort of order other than uh chronological. I did add a couple other photos where it might be helpful to interpret what we're looking at. But for the most part, this is just straight on the last few weeks of things that came across um, uh, my path when I was out. And this actually, this goes back, um, gosh, this will be coming up on uh, three weeks uh, pretty soon. Th this was during our um, KCC on our Kane County Certified Naturalist field trip at Hickory Knolls. Uh, we were talking uh, with our students about geology, but hey, anything is fair game when we've come across a teachable moment. And here is a male <clears throat> tiger swallowtail. And this this always kind of trips me up because the, the females, um, uh, one, they can be dark in color or two, uh, if they're this tiger type pattern, they can have blue here on their hind wings, whereas the male uh, lacks that blue. Uh, males are the ones that we are finding at this time of year uh, doing a behavior we call puddling, puddling with a P. Um, they are gathering uh, nutrients from the soil. Uh, it's not always soil, though. Sometimes we'll see them on scat. Um, so, uh, sometimes they're like in, in sand, uh, along the river, wherever there's, um, uh, uh, nutrients, especially minerals they are seeking so that they can become, uh, fit for breeding. But this, this guy, he was just absolutely gorgeous. I think recently emerged, this is a species that does not, uh, overwinter as an adult. It stays in its chrysalis. So it must have recently emerged in uh, some of the warm weather we were having a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, had I been thinking, I, I would have taken a video, but um, this was nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. My brain didn't kick in till probably 1030 or so. Luckily, I was uh, co-leading the field trip. Um, but, um, this, uh, you could see his, his body, uh, quivering and then the, the, the proboscis, the, the long, uh, curly tongue that they have was going in and out, um, as he was lapping up, uh, there was some moisture, uh, right underneath this, uh, park there next to the trail. So that, um, was super cool. Got our field trip off to a grand start <clears throat> and it only got better from there because then we found this. Uh, this, let's zoom in here. You can probably see what it is. Um, also, oddly enough, about the size of two good and plenties, but in a more elongated fashion. Um, this is a flicker um, scat. And this, so even now, uh, we've, we've had some rain, uh, we've had some sunshine. So uh, the recently burned areas uh, of which we had many, uh, our, our uh, restoration team was able to get through a lot of uh, their burn units this uh, very early in the season too. They were done, I think, you know, by mid, early to mid-March. Um, flickers, get, so flickers uh, love ants above all else. They, they do eat other things you know, as woodpeckers. Yeah, they are uh, adapted towards eating insects, but they love ants. And in the springtime, especially in prairies where that have been burned, um, there, there is an abundance of ant hills. And um, these guys are able to use their woodpecker 
uh, bills to to hammer into those mounds, eat the ants, and then they produce these scats that uh, look a little bit like a dollop of toothpaste. Um, let's zoom in just a little bit more. But when you crack them open, I was really trying to get, I'm not, you know, not that great of a photographer, but this is uh, what was inside. So this is a, a, a pretty much entire scat. This is a broken scat on the right, uh, right next to it. And um, it's all ant exoskeletons. The um, the ants that live in the prairie, uh, there's there's several different kinds, but there's one very common one that is kind of a golden uh, orange color. And so this the the exoskeletons inside the scat sparkle like fool's gold. It's really cool. It's really fun. Uh, it's they're really hard to find at other times of the year. I, truthfully, I don't know how much uh, the flickers are feeding on these ants later in the season either, because as the grasses and other uh, plants get taller on the prairie, those mounds are really hard to find. Uh, this is just a quick little reminder that our bat friends are up and around. They're awake. Uh, this was at uh, the shelter at Johnson's Mound. There was only one bat in the whole shelter, uh, so probably a male. Uh, we found it because there was scat on the picnic table below. And you, yeah, you really can't see anything. But here's his little nose. Here's his little ears. Uh, here are, so he's um, hanging upside down as bats do. His, his uh, feet are up here. And then these are what would be uh, the, the thumbs that are at the uh, bend in, uh, in his wing. What's also kind of cool, uh, if you're local and you do go out to Johnson's Mound, you will notice the wear on the beams in the picnic shelter. So um, <clears throat> over here on the left side of the screen, you see the, 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 the support beams. This is up at the top of the shelter. Uh, there's very little wear. Uh, they're dark all the way around, but this is the side that the bat lands on. So uh, the, the, the finish is roughed up. It's lighter in color. They they land and they grab on uh, with their nails, their little claws, and then they uh, hoist themselves up into these nooks and crannies up here. So this is the 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 scat on the the tables below or on the the uh, floor below is one clue. But then also you can see the landing pads up here uh, in the shelter. So these uh, this is what I was talking about with those ants. So this this again was. Um, a uh, couple going on three weeks ago now. This is at Peck Farm. Um, and all of these lumps are anthills. There's just so many of them. And some of them it look like uh, bunch grasses. And that's uh, because there's a relationship between ants and prairie grasses. And the, the ants... Uh, they don't feed on the plant, but they they uh, cluster sometimes in the the um, part of the uh, the crown of the plant that's near the ground where all the um, the stems come out of, and they uh, they help open up the soil. Uh, there was a study by some students at College of DuPage that showed that uh, that um, bunches uh, prairie plant prairie plant uh, grasses. Prairie, boy, let me try this one more time. Prairie grasses that have ants uh, living in and among them actually do better because the ants help aerate the soil and open up that crown so that um, the uh, the grass can send up more stalks. So um, it was really fun to poke around. Here's those ants. I, I wish I had a species for you, but I just haven't had a chance to key these out. Um, but I, you know, I thought for a little bit, man, what if I just keep going on and on about how cool ants are? And then these lumps aren't actually ant mounds, but they, they are. I, I uh, carefully dug into the side of a few of them. And I think these must be the ants that are in charge of protecting the rest of the colony because they were not at all happy and immediately went into a defensive mode um, at my intrusion. <laughs> um Here's some more, uh, let's see if I move this bar out of the way. Um, you can just see that they are everywhere in the prairie. So easily millions of ants there at Peck Farm. 
there's um, the Persinger Center. Here's Peck Farm. Uh, Persinger Center is, is kind of all the way up um, there on the horizon, right in the center of the photo. And then the uh, Peck Farm buildings are there on the right. Um, <clears throat> this prominent mound here in the foreground was um, about as high as my knee. So uh, lots of good work going on there uh, with these ants in the Peck Farm Prairie. Now this, oh, this does have audio. Hopefully you may be um, This was the next day. I was at Greenfield, which is uh, the retirement community on the west side of Geneva. Isn't that crazy? This is, you know, really kind of a nothing little drainage area. It's, it's taking you know, basically a retention pump. But they did have some interesting plants in it. Um, but these toads were just so local. It was it was truly um you know, if I had been with someone, this was, I was at Greenfields for a program that day. If I had been with someone, we would have had to shout to hear each other. Uh, there were toads throughout uh, this whole area um, doing their uh, their uh, mating calls. It's the males that uh, they call and the females that then respond. Um, they choose a mate depending on what they hear and what they like. Um, here's a fella in... Um, with his throat sack inflated um it's funny his voice was distinctly different um uh, his sound was distinctly different from the frogs uh from the toads around him um i don't know let's see did i record him all right yeah let's see uh you'll, you'll hear him kick in here I don't know, you know, if that's something, you know, as a as a female, uh, would a female toad find that distinctive voice or sound that he's making, um, you know, more appealing? Does that indicate he, he would be a, a better sire? Or, um, you know, he was all by himself. Maybe, maybe that's not what the ladies are looking for. I don't know. It was just... Um, took me a little bit of time to find uh, some individuals because look at look at so his profile here let's go back to this one you can see you know here uh, and I did uh, lighten this photo up a little bit so he was more obvious but um, that profile that he has is so similar to the profile of these bent over plant stems these cattails these reeds um, this time of the year uh, there is some green poking up, but there's an awful lot of last year's growth too. And these guys blend right in. But there there was easily, I don't know, 30 toads um, in this, just this one tiny little uh, drainage area. Now, um, Susie, here's your favorite. Uh, the, the red wing blackbirds are here. And, and um, Susie, I, I just have to share your innovations. Um, I actually shared this. Uh, Susie has um, some some neighbors that she kind of wish she didn't. The red winged blackbirds are very fond of the lilacs at her house. And so she's taken action this year with pinwheels, uh, reflective uh, pieces of uh, foil, um, shiny pinwheels, um, this accidental selfie. <laughs> um, this, these are little mirrors, uh, Jane, but these are the sorts of things that these birds find unattractive. Over here in downtown St. Charles, um, the uh, retirement uh, center called Carroll Towers used to have uh, the, the uh, caution, aggressive bird signs up every year uh, in the parking lot area north of their building, uh, which is right on the uh, Fox River, because it was such a, a favored spot for the red winged blackbird's nest. Well, um, I can't remember who donated the funds, and it was not 
to create a red wing blackbird deterrent. It was to create art. Um, these things called kinetic sculptures are like giant pinwheels. But that motion is uh, keeping the birds at bay in that area, keeping them away. It's been pretty effective. So this is a, like a, a miniature version of this, uh, those kinetic sculptures. Um, motion is something that birds are uneasy about and particularly unpredictable motion. So, you know, when there's a breeze, the pinwheel goes. Um, and then there's the, the shiny uh, aspect of uh, some of these pieces too. Those things um, are going to help keep the birds uh, guessing. Um, mounting them in different levels too. Susie has some on the ground. She has some up hanging in the trees or in the bushes. That's going to help as well. I, I shared these with uh, the supervisor at the park district who is in charge of River um, Riverview Mini Golf. So um, because last year she had the double whammy of a goose nesting and it's mate protecting the area around the nest. And it was like, I don't know, like the 15th hole, I think. And then uh, there were also uh, red winged blackbird nests in the uh, shrubbery around the mini golf course. So she's going to take some of these um, uh, materials and um, see if she can't uh, keep those red wings off of the course as well. Oh, I forgot to put in a... Um, uh, sensitive viewers avert your eyes these next couple photos it was even hard for me to look at um, this was a little bit of a, a snake uh, a misfortune and it's not just one snake there were three fox snakes on route 25 that were just squished squished uh, this was last uh, was that last week or two weeks ago um might have been two weeks ago now um I don't know. Uh, so this area of Route 25 is uh, right by the bridge that goes over the railroad tracks. And again, if you're local, you know those tracks are under construction because they're adding a third rail line, not a third rail, but a third line uh, through town. And it's a multi-year project. I don't know if these uh, snakes were driven out because of the construction or if it was part of a natural migration. I went over, they were um, in the uh, southbound lane, so they were closer to the west side of Route 25. Um, but I did go over, this is on the east side of 25. You really can't see this when you're driving uh, along, um, going up the road, approaching that, um, that bridge over the railroad tracks, but this actually looks like a really cool hibernaculum. These are all um, supports, uh, you know, keeping that slope in place because there are houses across this street here. But it seemed odd to me that the snakes would have been able to make it almost all the way to the other side and then get squished. So um, I'm sort of thinking they were starting on the other side from this. Uh, so this might make a dandy snake hibernaculum, but I don't think that's where those snakes were living. On the other side, uh, closer to where the snakes were found, this is a uh, city of Geneva um, public works area. They've got a lot of mulch stored back there. There's uh, brush, I'm guessing from, I don't know what, uh, you know, soil, all the sorts of things that um, uh, municipal workers uh, generate, you know, in terms of brush and then use in terms of um, uh, mulch and, and soil for different projects. Um, this area here on the left side of the picture is a, a just a scrubby mess of buckthorn and honeysuckle and litter. But, you know, snakes really love litter that, you know, uh, bag, uh, plastic bags and um, bottles and old broken pieces of pipe. I mean, it really is a mess, but that's a lot of, some of the, the, the best snake hunting I've ever done, snake, not hunting to kill, but hunt, hunting to take pictures of has been in um, uh, areas where there's been a lot of trash. Um, so I don't know if the snakes maybe were disturbed by the construction and were thinking maybe it's time to to move and they ended up on the road. Um, this 
was some snake jerky that I found on the um, sidewalk. You actually, there is actually a little pedestrian walkway on that bridge on Route 25 going over the railroad tracks. And this almost looked like uh, the remains of a bird of prey, uh, having torn open the snake and, you know, eaten a little bit of it. Oops. Oh, yeah, let's look at this. This is much more pleasant. But um, there, there's certainly a lot of fox snakes in a pretty small area there. Hopefully, you know, th we saw the unlucky ones, but hopefully there's other ones that are uh, remaining there and maybe uh, took a different path to uh, escape the activities that are going on there. I, I took this picture. Um, I don't been in the snow. Uh, where have I been? This might have been Delnor Woods. Um, this is our, our native phlox. Um, there's another plant that grows here called Dame's Rocket, and a lot of people call those phlox. Uh, the Dame's Rocket is not blooming yet, but it is a um, it's a member of the mustard family, and we, we all know about that other member of the mustard family, the garlic mustard. Uh, Dame's Rocket seeds just as prolifically as garlic mustard does. The flower uh, blooms and then uh, this it gets pollinated, it sets its seeds, and then we get a whole bunch more dame's racket. Um, dame's racket, um, as I said, some people call it flax, but it only has four petals. And here we can see these nice uh, pinwheel types of blooms here with one, two, three, four, five petals. The phlox, uh, I was at Delnor Woods yesterday, they are still blooming, so there's still time to see them. It's a lovely, kind of a purplish blue color, almost the color of bluebells, uh, but with a different type of foliage accompanying it, our native phlox. And this, um, so uh, these guys have been in my refrigerator all winter. This was a little gift from our ecological restoration crew. They all know that as they're cutting things down in the winter, winter work for uh, restoration folks is mostly chainsaw work, cutting down uh, invasive shrubs, but also trees. Um, in the past few years, they have gone after black locust, um, the, uh, the introduced the white mulberry, um, and they even will take down uh, box elder and cottonwood, which are native, but oftentimes uh, are, occur in, in greater numbers than um, they want them to be. Those trees will, will hog all the sunlight and soak up all the water and make it difficult for other plants to survive. So um, I believe this was a box elder they were cutting down. And this is um, about half of the, uh, the beetle larvae that were in, um, and that, that they brought over to Good Natured World Headquarters. I don't know what they are. There are keys for um, identifying beetle larvae, but I don't know enough about the parts to really use them effectively. I'm pretty sure this lump, it's its much larger um, than, um, it's, I think there's extra wet, uh, moist soil attached to it. But when these uh, larvae, pupate, they create a cocoon out of the soil around them. And I think that's what's in the center of this clump here. I did find uh, a couple others um, that had already pupated as well. Um, their little cocoons are actually about the size of uh, this owl pellet. So um, I'm, I'm kind of excited. I don't know exactly how long it takes for them to uh, transform, but uh, check out these, check out these mouth parts. Isn't that cool? So they have um, the ability to digest uh, trees. So they, they work in um, conjunction with the, the fungi that are breaking down the um, cellulose and the lignin in the tree. And then the gut bacteria of these uh, larvae also help break that down. And then when they excrete their little fecal pellets, um, they are turning that tree back into soil again. Uh, but I'm hopeful uh, it's probably a type of scarab beetle and we've got a whole bunch of different kinds. So I don't know exactly what. Um, several years ago, I had raised some beetles that were about this size and they turned out to be um, grapevine beetles, which are orange with some uh, little spots on their back. 
Um, and then another time there were some, um, oh, I just drew a blank on the, uh, the, the genus name. They were uh, Russian leather beetles, but not, um, they were the, uh, the uh, U.S. equivalent of the leather beetles. Uh, they, they get their name because they have this pleasant sort of leathery smell about them, like oiled leather. But I'll keep you posted. I did move the tank outside here so that um, they could enjoy the humidity of the air. Um, dry weather is, uh, dry air is an enemy for all sorts of insects. But we'll see. Hopefully we'll get some some beetles to share in a few weeks. So this is just a quick series of photos. I was uh, down at the homestead in Batavia last week in the rain. Uh, well, I was inside, but when I came out to, to leave, it was raining quite hard. And um, this is, uh, let's zoom in here. You can see, I'm thinking this is Papa Goose. I think Mama is probably sitting on eggs, but there he was in the middle of uh, the street as I was making my way out of the, uh, the campus there. I watched this. Uh, so he moves over. Can you see what's over here? He's very cautiously approaching. Remember the homestead, I think a few weeks ago, we looked at these, uh, they have these uh, coyote uh, decoys placed and they keep, they're doing a good job. They are moving them around. So that's keeping the geese on their toes. But this, this goose is like, wait a minute. This thing isn't moving at all. I'm going to get closer and closer and closer and closer. It was the funniest thing. So I, and luckily there wasn't any cars behind me cause it was really kind of, kind of funny to uh, see him experience this. And you can just imagine what's going on in that little goose brain. Cause there's the, you know, there's the, the fixed stare of the predator, the, the ears uh, are erect, which indicates interest. The mouth is open. Um, from the other side, you can see the teeth. And here this goose is like, I got this figured out. So I don't know. I, I would imagine the next time I go there, this uh, this decoy will be somewhere else because the geese have its number. They have figured it out. Uh, this was from a program last Saturday at the Hickory Knolls Natural Area. It doesn't look as though this grass is thriving, and it's not. It's actually dying. In this case, though, it's a good thing. Um, this is an example of what our restoration crew is doing right now. This is a big patch of a grass called Hungarian brome. So uh, brome grass is a pretty common uh, forage plant for cattle. And it uh, has existed in large patches throughout uh, the natural area. Um, there's another patch where maybe six or seven years ago, Jill, who is part of our uh, restoration crew, had uh, uh, killed the brome with a, a grass-specific herbicide and then went back with um, just a lovely assortment of uh, prairie forbs or prairie flowers. <clears throat> and... Um, you wouldn't believe the diversity. She purposely left uh, a patch uh, of brome on one side of a trail and then put uh, a diverse mix of prairie plants on the other side. And it was just really stunning how many insects you could see and hear on the diverse side of the trail and just how you know, quiet and um, not helpful the brome side was so this is an area one of, of many many areas in progress at the the hickory knolls natural area but this was a this was a tour led by patrick bohenik who is another of our uh, uh, restoration ecologists and he uh, was able to tell a lot about uh, tell our group a lot about uh, the challenges that they're facing uh, restoring this 130-acre uh, parcel. The the natural area at Hickory Knolls has had a lot of different, um, what would you call it, insults over the years. It uh, it was um, mined. I don't know if you'd call it mined or quarried. Maybe quarried is a better word. A lot of the glacial deposits that were put there during the Ice Age were dug out. And uh, then when the holes that were created by that activity uh, you know, were gaping there, people would bring garbage out. And so there's there's still pockets of trash all over. Um, and then there were there were areas where cattle were run. So um, there's lots of 
um, forage grasses like this that they are still trying to get under control. Um, place again if you're local I haven't been out there in a while might be a nice uh, spot for a walk don't worry about the dead grass it's going to be replaced with cool stuff um, this so while uh, Patrick was talking about restoration activities I was looking on the ground and we found this was really strange and I don't know if this was a, a predator who caught this these are two shrews I suppose I should have warned you again sensitive viewers avert your eyes you can tell by the pointy nose here um and the pointy nose here these are shrews so they are not rodents and it just seems like um animals uh mammals i should say um don't seem to care for their taste uh there are some shrews that have venom in their uh, uh part of their digestive system they can um chew uh, uh, venom into their prey. I'm not sure if these guys can or not. I believe these are masked shrews. Um, didn't do a whole lot of, spend a whole lot of time uh, trying to sort out what they were. It was just interesting to me that there were two of them. Uh, they looked as though they had been punctured, um, but then they were left behind. So I'm thinking maybe a mammal tried to eat them and then went, yeah, and spit them out. Um, Oh, these, these did not turn out well at all. And uh, Jerry, I know you sent me some really nice photos and I just didn't have a chance to incorporate them tonight. Jerry participated in a, a citywide nature challenge over the last weekend and Jerry's a great photographer. So um, Jerry took some pictures of the same species. Um, uh, I this little there was two of these guys in our backyard. These are um, white throated sparrows. There's also the white crowned sparrow that uh, lacks this this white throat patch. So these this picture is not nearly as good as Jerry's, but this is a bird to keep your eyes open for right now because they are um, uh, moving through. And you can also listen for them. This is the bird that has the. Um, now, there's different words depending on who you ask. Uh, the song can um, go, oh, uh, poor Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Um, but other people say, oh, Canada, 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 because that's actually where they're going to be headed um, or be on their way. They're not going to be beheaded. <laughs> they're going to be heading that way uh, because they breed up north. Now this was super cool. This was, um, I've got a lot of pictures of this. This is not, um, these aren't birds. These are caddisflies. We had a huge emergence. Everybody's talking about you now all the billions of cicadas that are gonna be coming up as part of the uh, brood uh, 13 and brood 19 emergence here in Illinois. Uh, but these are caddisflies. Uh, they're part of our annual um, activities around the Fox River. Some people get really upset because uh, they don't like, they call them river bugs. Um, but let's see if this will play here. This is, um, the scattering here is just Ooh, what I <laughs> sound down here. This was um, uh, nature nods, nerds ooing and eyeing over uh, the spectacle here. Maybe you've heard about um, you know, uh, the, I think they, they, they call them the murmurations, uh, the, the, uh, the flight patterns of uh, starling flocks in flight and how they make these cool swoops and turns and they seem to be moving in a, almost like a synchronized ballet. Um, that's, these um, bugs were moving in a, a fashion like that too. And it, um, uh, it was really kind of cool. They seem to be clustering around uh, the tops of trees. And I've heard that these, I've heard these called mating swarms. So so once these insects, uh, which live for about a year in the water as larvae, once they pupate and they leave the water, their time is very short. I'm not even sure that they're able to feed while they are in the adult stage. They really are just focused on um, finding a mate and uh, laying some eggs in the water so that the process can start over again. But there were just clouds of these caddisflies in different parts. Here's one that's taken a break from the action. Um, if we zoom in, we see it looks a lot like a moth, but um, uh, the antennae are a little bit longer, uh, less thread-like than what we see on the moths. There's some 
odd little um, hairs here on the legs. And then if we were to take a magnifying glass to these wings, we'd see that they are not covered with scales, which is what is uh, the feature of our moths and our butterflies, but they're actually covered with little hairs. Uh, the the order that these guys belong to is Trichoptera, which means hairy wings. And uh, this is one of several different um, uh, types of caddisflies that we have in this area. I was kind of hoping we could see some some feeding activity. Uh, this is a an insect. They're not real big. I didn't um, I didn't use anything for scale here, but um, the, these insects are probably a little bit. If we don't include the antennae, they're you know, maybe around a half an inch or so, a centimeter, a little over a centimeter in length. Um, and they, they are, there's a lot of fat in those little bodies that, um, uh, make for some good eating. We did see, um, what, um, might've been, I did, I heard some chimney swifts. They were feeding at a higher level than these guys were flying at. And then I thought I caught a glimpse of a nighthawk, but then I thought, yeah, I'm not sure if the nighthawks are back yet. Nighthawks would certainly feed on these if they were here. Um, but it's uh, nice that these the mating swarms, uh, there's certainly going to be enough caddisflies survive so that the species continues, but if they're also flying at a time when there's a lot of birds migrating or raising their young. So they're looking for a food source like this to uh, sustain themselves. Oh, see, yeah, really, really cool stuff. Uh, it's not showing up as well uh, on the screen as it did on... Um, the picture that I saved, but those are all caddisflies. Super cool. Oh, and this was just a little scene from uh, the kitchen here at Casa Auto. This is my guy, Artie. And these were the beetles before I set them out. I don't know if he could sense they, they're, they're not moving anymore in there. So I don't know if there might be some other creatures. Uh, I know I, I supplemented the soil that the beetles were in and maybe I brought in some roly polies or something, but he just stared through that class for probably five minutes. And then he walked around to the other side and stared at the other side. So um, it's kind of funny. Um, all right, we're getting, uh, got a few more minutes here yet. Um, lots of nest predation lately. This uh, this was down at the Batavia uh, Riverwalk, the wildflower sanctuary there. Um, but I've also seen... Um, there was a, a duck nest at Potawatomi. Uh, this is actually a, a goose egg. This, um, this egg was about the size of my fist that was uh, um, opened and odd enough not eaten. Um, there were a couple of nests, uh, goose nests here that, um, and, and the geese were still milling around. So I, I guess they're gonna you know, try and um, sort that out later, uh, maybe try to nest one more time. Be just because they uh, nest fails doesn't mean that they're done with breeding. They can try again, sometimes even a third time, although the clutch size might go down um, because you know, females only got so much, uh, you know, calcium and, and you know, drive to uh, produce those eggs. Um, these are some uh, woolly, alder aphids and this is um they they look kind of like uh marshmallows stuck on the end of the, so these are you can see these leaves here these are alders this is also at the wildflower sanctuary in batavia um this is uh one of many different types of aphids that needs two different plants to complete its life cycle. So it spends part of its time here on the uh, the alder, and then it takes a different form and um, spends part of the year, uh, a different generation spends part of the year over on the silver maples. So when you've got that combination of silver maples and alders, you can find these um, interesting little creatures here. There's another um, type that uh, of uh, woolly aphid that looks very similar, but it only occurs on beech trees. Uh, well, actually beech and whatever the alternate host is, I can't remember offhand. 
Um, and I was kind of wishing that this was an area where we had more beech trees because um, when I was reading on uh, the, the life cycle and requiring two different plants, they talked about defensive tactics and how the beech, um, the beech aphids, and that's B E E C H, the beech as in the tree. They um, they wiggle the tips of their abdomens, um, and they call them the the boogie woogie uh, aphids. <laughs> These guys they just kind of clump together and you know rely on safety and numbers. But um, if you happen to uh, ever be in an area where there's beech trees, you might want to look for those uh, beech aphids. Ah, a little shot of the Batavia Dam. It's still hanging in there. Um, there's got a lot of um, a lot of breaches to it, but it's it's uh, still there. And then it, you can't see it in this photo, but uh, sometimes uh, as uh, we get through uh, the warmer weather months, if we're in July and August, and the water level drops, you can see the remnants of the even older dam that's up above. It's upstream of the uh, the present dam in downtown Batavia. So here's our little friend. I saw this from a distance. This, this had to be including the legs um, over two inches. This, this was an impressive little lady sunning herself there next to the dam. My first thought was big spider next to water. I'll bet it's a fishing spider. But as I got closer, I thought, mm-mm. This is a wolf spider. Um, and the reason uh, we know this is the markings combined with the uh, somewhat beefier legs. Uh, there's this stripe here down the back. I think this is, they've, they've been monkeying around again with the taxonomy of our wolf spiders. And there's now a group, uh, a genus called Tigrosa. And uh, they talk about Tigrosa having this uh, yellowish stripe here between the eyes. Look at her eyes. Bing, 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 bing. This is definitely a spider that ambushes. It uses those eyes to uh, uh, sense its prey. I, I thought just for kicks, I went back and I pulled um, a picture from a couple of years ago of a fishing spider so we can see the two. So this this is, uh, again, from here, the, the long front legs to the long back legs, a little bit over two inches. Um, this is a fishing spider. Uh, from the tip of its front legs to the tip of its back legs, it's more like uh, three and a half inches. So, so larger spider. And then they have this uh, kind of W-shaped marking on the back. This is um, uh, Scripta is the, the species name of this fishing spider. Scripta because of the, uh, it looks like script across the abdomen. And you'll notice that that is absent on this. So she's got the the yellow up here by the eyes and the, the lack of the W here. It's just a, a beefier, chunkier spider. Um, the uh, fishing spider is is longer limbed, uh, a little bit more uh, spread up by this. This one, by the way, um, so a wolf spider, uh, and these are both females, a wolf spider here, um, when she produces an egg sac, she's going to uh, spin silk and attach it to the back of her abdomen here. Um, fishing spiders are part of a family called the nursery web spiders. So what we can't see in this picture is what well, you can kind of see up here at the top right. Um, that's silk on the other side of this leaf was a nursery. There was, you can see some of it in the lower part here. All the, she spins this big web. And uh, then she guards her nursery of baby little little spiderlings as they grow up. So two different strategies. Um, she before that she carries hers uh, her spiders uh, spider eggs in her uh, front jaws. So two different strategies uh, by two of our largest areas spiders. Just a little reminder: leaves of three, let it be. Yes, it's up again. Um, this is uh, what. Poison ivy looks like currently the uh, leaves are that reddish cast of them, but pretty soon it is going to uh, green up. It's going to blend in really well with a companion plant that we often find near it. This is Virginia creeper. Leaves of five, uh, not typically a problem for people. Um, the, people sometimes refer to the mittens of the, uh, the leaves on the uh, poison ivy. There's a thumb 
on the uh, two side leaves and then the, the mitten part and then uh, just uh, regular uh, scalloped edges here on the leaf in the middle. So these plants are, they're newly emerged, but they will be growing quickly with this warm weather and uh, something we should look out for. I have totally forgotten how many more slides we have to go before we're done, but I see we're after nine o'clock. So I'm just gonna plow through a couple more here. This is a super cool shrub that we see uh, not too often in this area. This are, It's in bloom right now. You might recognize it from when we've talked about it before. It is pollinated by beetles and flies, the insects that like the non-traditional kind of stinky flowers. This is a pawpaw. Uh, it's actually hard to attract pollinators in this area. Um, I've heard of people who will uh, put roadkill or um, spoiled meats nearby to try and get the flies in the area with the hopes that they uh, will then pollinate the flowers. But a lot of people who grow pawpaws, you don't see pawpaws for sale very often because they are kind of difficult to grow, but the people who do get them to grow oftentimes will hand pollinate. So they'll take a little paintbrush and they'll move the pollen around. Uh, May apples are blooming. Seems kind of early, but um, that, uh, little flower there is going to turn into a little uh, miniature Granny Smith apple uh, probably in another month or so. We've got just a few little white trillium there up on the hill at the sanctuary in Batavia. I thought this was kind of cool and we are getting close to the end. Um, I had never seen the flowers on a blue ash. Wildflower Sanctuary does have um, quite a number of blue ash on the uh, the east part of the uh, the path there. By the way, if you haven't been there, the the Batavia Wildflower Sanctuary is um, just north of the police station in downtown Batavia. It wraps around the building, uh, the River Rain apartments that are down there. These are the flowers of a blue ash, um, and just so that we can see what they turn into, I grabbed this photo off of the Google. This is what the seeds of the blue ash look like. So uh, you can kind of see how that relates. These are the flowers. They get pollinated and they turn into seeds that also have this spread out and dangly look. All right, we did it folks, we made it to the end. I just wanted to leave you, let me move this bar out of the way. I saw this and it made me chuckle. Maybe it will make you laugh too. How do I get rid of this? Um, that's an interesting pet. What's his name? Tiny. What an odd name. Why do you call him Tiny? Because he's minute. <laughs> I almost, uh, I uh, I have a picture of an Eastern newt. I don't know what kind of newt this is, but um, I could not, uh, I couldn't Photoshop it in time for tonight. But a um, little funny to end our uh, time together on. Let's see, now that I've, had the share on. Let's stop the share. Um, that's it, folks. Uh, looks like we got just a couple of chats to get to um, as we wind things up. Uh, Jerry, you want to find an owl pellet from Screech Owl? Oh, yeah, you said you've been hearing one. Um, yes, they do usually regurgitate where they roost. So um, uh, if you know where it's spending time, uh, look around on the ground. Again, they're 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 pretty small. Um, if you put two good and plenty side by side, that's about the size of a screech owl pellet. Um, so, oh, you know, uh, and then your question about um, yeah, plant stalks. That, that's funny. We're actually filming um, a video segment tomorrow for our, uh, the park district's green team. We were going to, we're talking about lawn cleanup. I think we're getting to the point now where things are, emerging. Um, I do still have a cocoon um, from a uh, polyphemus moth. I'm not sure if it's going to uh, emerge or not, but so the, like we saw that the, the tiger swallowtails are out um, now. I think a lot of things are starting to emerge. I would think, you know, within the next couple of weeks, things should be moving. Um, I do though, like when I do cut stocks down, I kind of just leave them. I don't put them in a bag for pickup. I leave them 
around somewhere with the hopes that even though the orientation is different, if there is still anything left in there, that they'll be able to find their way out. But we are we are getting to the point now where um, things things are moving on to their next stage. So uh, things that are inside those stocks are um, pupating and emerging. I've been as I I pulled down some um, when I had some mountain mint in the front. And I, I actually was splitting it open to see if there was anything inside. And I did see a couple of empty, um, they look like spun silk little um, cocoons of something. I don't, I'm going to guess maybe some solitary bees, but I don't know for sure. But they were empty. So um, I think we are getting close to the point where if, if you do need to make them go away, if you can make them go away, but keep them in a, a you know, a, less obvious part of your yard just to be safe that's not a bad idea but yeah my little chicago yard is getting overrun with with stout plant stocks <laughs> so, i you I'll know hold I, off i i hear you jerry and i actually found i've i've some stem stashes from last year that i forgot to to you know move along too so so yeah i think i think we're okay um uh, especially also yeah, a couple more weeks well and we are everything is you know seemingly farther ahead than we normally see at the end of april um like the may apples i it seems really early because we always i remember explaining that may apple you know we're actually seeing the blooms in may and then the apples don't come till june but i think we're going to actually see apples on the may apples in may from the way they are so far ahead all right, folks, uh, it is 10 after, well, almost 10 after um, on a school night. So um, I think we are, are close to getting caught up. Um, we will be meeting next week, next Tuesday at 8 o'clock. So if it's at all possible for you to join in the fun, I'd love to have you back. In the meantime, have a great rest of your week. Um, hopefully you can uh, take advantage of some good nature in your own neck of the woods. Uh, see you again real soon. Cheers, Thank everybody. Thanks, Pam. Thank Thanks, Pam. Good night. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam.